Okay. All right. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to BC310 uh, class on chat and ministry administration. Thank you for uh, joining the class today. Let's uh, pray together and then we can get started. Could one of us please just pray with the class and then we will get started? Anyone? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We thank you for this day. Uh, we thank you for the class we are about to have where we learn about uh, how to administer the church and the ministry that you have uh, given us the responsibility to Jesus. God, I pray that as we are listening, uh, you will help us to understand uh, on how to handle things in the right way so that we can uh, live life for your glory, Jesus. Uh, we bless Pastor Ashes and I bless every one of my classmates over here, let it be a good time of learning, let it be a time where we understand more about you and the kingdom. We give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you so much. And once again, good morning. Welcome to everybody. So in our course on church and ministry administration, we I've been in lesson, we started lesson number seven last week, and we were talking about church staff management, and we were just going through, you know, step by step on how we do things, uh, and, and so on. So let's quickly review, and then we'll take this forward today, uh, look at some new things. Um, I did share uh, some samples of these documents in the classwork section, so you can uh, take it, modify it, feel free to use it in your uh, ministries uh, as a menu, just feel it's useful. So, you know, uh, we said that um, a very important part of ministry is uh, overseeing, managing the people uh, who are working in the ministry. And, uh, you know, the way we are structured here, we have full time staff, those people who are working full-time for the church. They are paid a monthly salary. Then we have consultants. Uh, consultants are paid hourly, uh, and they can work for us remotely from anywhere. And then we have volunteers. Volunteers are most people from the congregation who are serving freely. They're giving their time, their energy uh, uh, into the ministry. And uh, they're not paid. Uh, they are just volunteer time. So we talked about, you know, you know, how do we have a good team of people? You know, how do we all work together nicely without problems so that the ministry, the work of the God's kingdom can go on well? Um, so we emphasized, uh, first of all, the hiring process. So especially when we are taking on staff and consultants, we uh, try to have a very thorough hiring process. To make sure that uh, you know before we take people on, they can really fit into what we're looking for. Because uh, if we take somebody on and then there are the problems, it becomes a little difficult to say, you know, please you have to go. It's not working out. On that that's that's a little painful process. So better, it's always good to put the effort in the beginning. Make sure that people are you know well suited to. Uh, and so I kind of shared with you know some some practical things we do, how we interview people and so on. And uh, uh, we also do you know uh, eligibility checks. We all do the job of a letter. I shared with you about the staff guidelines and new employee orientation. Let me just pause here. I think there may be a question on the chat. Um, okay, so there's a little question there. From Jeffina, uh, I have a doubt looking documents you said. So, you made the guidelines all by yourself, or those who are head of that ministry, like youth pastors, and spread the guidelines. And do you have any pattern for guidelines in these? Um, are there areas that must be, work, must be covered in the guidelines? Okay, good question. So, um, so we have what we call as the staff guidelines, um, or staff and consultant guidelines, which is for anybody whom we 
come and join our ministry. Uh, so that was something that I put together, and it has evolved over time. So, you know, in the early days, maybe it was four pages, <laughs> now it's become, I think, 20 some pages, whatever. As we keep seeing every year, or, you know, we keep adding content or changing it based on the needs. So that was something uh, that has evolved over time. Then we also have guidelines for every area of the ministry. And so that's, a, that's a, 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 let me see here, it's available on our guidelines page. So every area of ministry has uh, these guidelines documents. So in some cases, I have written some of them, but most of it has been written by the people who are in charge of the ministry. So I tell them, I said, see, uh, you are in charge of the ministry. You write down what you need people in your team to do. Example, book table. It's a simple thing. You just come arrange the books on the table and pack it up, arrange it and pack it up. It may be a simple piece of uh, work every Sunday, but there are certain guidelines, meaning how do you want the books to be arranged? You can't just simply put all the books on the table, right? English books have to be in one section, other language, you know, right now we are only keeping English. So all the books have to be arranged in a certain way. How should they pack it up? How should they store it? How should they communicate with the church office that they need more books, right? So it is better to write all these things down so that somebody joining the team, uh, they can read this document and they understand how to do their work as a volunteer. It's very simple. Otherwise, every new person I have to tell everything, I have to repeat the guidelines to them. It's a problem. So I, I just tell the ministry leader. So. Um, uh, most of these guide, the ministry guidelines are written by the ministry leader. And we try to keep it updated. That means, uh, you know, how we do things, if things change, I just tell them, okay, you update the guideline document. Yeah. So that's how it works. So in the final, do they check everything after looking at the guidelines? Yeah, so I would just run, I mean, if they'll send it to me, I just look at it, yeah, everything is fine. Then we put it on the website and they, then they start discussing. It. So I'll just review it very quick. About the second question, over there, uh, is there any pattern like that we want to? These must be the areas that must be covered in the guidelines. Yeah, our main objective in the guidelines is to make sure that 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 particular ministry area is functioning well. You know that 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 work in that ministry should be done well. And if it is a very, uh, if it is a very, let's say, a very uh, uh, visible ministry, like if it is something that's on stage, for example, especially the worship team, right? Then we have to be even more careful because these people are standing on the stage. It is like a, it is a spiritual ministry. So worship team, life group leaders, ministry leaders, those are heading up ministries. Very visible. That is the guy. The standard has to be higher. Because people are seeing them. Whereas if, okay, book table is simple. You come, you arrange the books, pack the books, go. Nobody's, I mean, you know, they're not paying too much attention and who is doing it. Whereas in the worship team, people are watching. This person is singing, this person is playing the instrument, you know, because they're on the stage for at least one hour, right? every Sunday. Uh, people are watching, and so people will question their conduct, their behavior, all those things. So for them, we have to be even more careful and say, hey, it is not just how you play your instrument. People are watching your testimony. Now, how you are on the stage and how you are off the stage. People are watching. So for them, the standards will be, the guidelines will be a little bit more strict. Whereas somebody in the back stage, I mean, of course, we want everybody to have proper conduct, but we don't necessarily need to spell out everything. Whereas for the for the guidelines and people who are on stage, we actually spell out, you know, hey, dress decently, dress. <laughs> because uh, otherwise people come to us. You know, a pastor, this person was wearing this kind of <laughs> I'm like, oh yo, this, uh, this these problems are happening. So we have to be a little careful, you know, in, in those things. So if you write the guidelines down, as new people keep joining the team, you know, we just say, hey, just go through the guidelines, just follow the guidelines. 
This is how we want to operate. Okay. All right, so let's move forward. Um, feel free to ask any questions. So we also talked a little bit about employee compensation. How do you decide on the salary that you have to pay the people? And of course, it all so it all depends on uh, how much each organization is able to pay and um, how the organization grows over time. So those are other those are factors. But then we also looked at you know what are the criteria, you know, uh, their competencies, how they how much responsibility do they carry, how much leadership they provide. These are things that you take into account when you are deciding on the salaries that you want to give to the people. And then the last part that we uh, touched upon was the employee management, which is how do you keep people motivated you know, to come and do the work with uh, passion? Right? Uh, every some page twenty-five, you know, uh, every week after week, day after day, they come and they work. And how do you keep them energized, passionate, passion? Keep them full of passion. Uh, and so we shared some thoughts on that, and uh, we also talked about uh, some of the demotivators, things that can actually demotivate people. All right, so the next thing I want to talk about is uh, employee satisfaction. Uh, so I, I, I'll share with you uh, a simple job satisfaction survey. Uh, that means maybe once a year, I'm not saying we have to do this very often, but once a year, uh, just to see ask some questions in, a, in an anonymous way. So people should feel comfortable. They can say what they want. Uh, it's not without giving out their name. Uh, a simple survey where we ask them, you know, are you happy, basically, are you happy working here? Or what are the things we can do better? So sometimes people won't come and tell us directly, uh, it is, you know, these are the problems I'm facing. So at least if you give an opportunity where they can say it, without feeling I am going to be judged or it's going to be held against me in an anonymous way, uh, that's a useful thing. Now, of course, uh, uh, as I will talk about it a little later, uh, I try to meet with other people throughout the year, like you know, regularly on a monthly basis. Uh, some people I talk every week, every week we are you know, constantly talking, discussing things uh, in different areas of ministry. So it's almost every week surely at least once a month where we discuss but i can't do this for all the staff only meet with the the pastors and the leaders of the ministry i can't talk, meet with every person you know all the staff all of this i can't do we won't have time for that but we do want to get feedback from everybody anybody in the organization staff or staff consultant or volunteer uh, should be given an opportunity to just say, you know, hey, these are some problems I'm facing. These are some challenges. They should be given the opportunity. And doing a survey or setting up an opportunity. The survey is only an opportunity. We can think of other ways. Like you can have an open house or you can have, you know, uh, an email ID that says feedback at ABC. So you just send an email. You're welcome to give feedback. You know? So people should know that uh, if I have some concerns, I can speak up and not be afraid. No, I just tell, hey, this is a problem. Uh, then at least we can try to address it. For example, just two weeks back, uh, I think it was uh, two weeks back, somebody in one of our church locations, uh, he sent an email. And his email was that he was being asked to do the PowerPoint every Sunday. And he was not given a break. Uh, like that. No, so it was like he's expressing a concern. So I've been asked, I'm doing this every Sunday. I don't have a break. And every Sunday I have to come and I have to do this. You know, so I immediately I was actually upset with the the pastors in charge of that church because it is our understanding that we always rotate respond, you know, the work so that no no one person should feel burdened. By that response, that is our norm, normal thing. In our uh, that's the way we always work. So we don't want to burden 
one person or a few people with the response to every time you want to share it and so we roster people we rotate it so i was quite upset like how come this is going wrong you know so i immediately so we had i spoke to the ask the guy see i got this email this email this person sent an email to feedback so he gave his feedback so then i asked you know, and then we took immediately we took action like we said hey give him a break you know, let give him let him rest for, for at least for next few months. Don't ask him to do the PowerPoint. Let him rest. When he is ready to serve again, let him come and say, "I'm ready to serve." Then you roster him, but do it in a way that will not be a burdensome to that person. We have to care for the people. We can't just put the load on them and make them, you know, work every day. So. In one way, it was, I felt disappointed because we already have a procedure how we work, but in this particular case, it was not being followed. But in the other way, other hand, I was happy that this person could say, he could express himself and say, hey, I am feeling tired. <laughs> I'm being told to do this every Sunday. I can't do it every Sunday. I'm happy that he said, because only then uh, we could, you know, uh, correct the situation. And so we we did it immediately. Uh, within two Sundays, we went and we trained some more people on how to do the PowerPoints, how to do things, so that there are more people now who know how to do it and who can help with the media work. So that that media work is not on only on one person; it is shared, and he's been given a break, so he can come and just enjoy the service, just worship with his family, and whenever he's ready, he can always start doing it again. The good point, good thing is, people should be able to say, you know, whether they are staff or consultants or volunteers, they should be able to express, and we should support them. Now, the other thing we do, and, and uh, the next few things that I'm going to say is uh, mainly with with uh, full time staff. Um, we, you know, we every December. All our church staff complete a planning document. That means they will write out. Uh, it's a review and planning. So that means they will write. They will write their own review of the previous year. How did this year go? You know, what are the good things that happened? What are the areas you feel you should have done better? So it's basically they are themselves reviewing their own work. And they will write a planning for the next year. That means, what do you, what are your in your areas of ministry? What are what are you planning to work towards in this area? So everybody writes that and they send it to me, or they will send it to their immediate team leader. So whoever is overseeing their work, and so that person will be just over, go through that. And in January is when we go through these talks. So in December, they'll write it and send it. January, each one will sit with their own person, people, to review this. OK, so this is what we learned from last year. These are the good things that happened. These are areas you know you could have done better. And you didn't pay much attention to. So in this year, OK, what are the things you can do better? So that. Annual, at least once a year, this happens right? for all the stuff, and it happens in a very formal way. That means they have to write it, write everything down, and you know they have a, each one is. Um, I will meet with some of the people. The leaders will meet with their people and review it. It's like a very formal thing. That means the, the, the whole reason is. We are saying, you know, take your work seriously. Mm -hmm. uh, learn from what happened the previous year. Plan to do better the next year. You know, so uh, don't just go on blindly, just doing this and not knowing what you're doing. Have some plans. Do your best. Right? So, so that this exercise happens every December and in January. So, so before the year goes into full swing, people are. Okay, this year I have to work on these things. No? But the thing is, we cannot 
especially in ministry, they cannot put too many numbers. Like meaning we can't say, this year you have to bring 500 people to Christ. <laughs> this year you have to uh, preach so many conferences. And we can't say that, you know. Unlike whereas in a corporate setting, you can put numbers, you know, you can put sales numbers, you can put whatever, you know, because you have to do this, you have to do that. Whereas in the ministry, uh, we can't do that. It's not something we dictate. Those numbers are not what we dictate. So we don't, so it's more of a qualitative assessment. That means, how did things go? Where could you have done better? What's your plan for the coming year? What are the area, focus areas, things you're going to focus on in your ministry? And how are you going to do it? Now, in some cases, we, we try and put numbers. Example, worship team, right? I, 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 I challenge, and this is to challenge them. For example, I told them, Hey, every year you release one new album. With the album will have at least six to eight new songs. So challenge every year release one new album, six to eight new songs. But to have six to eight new songs, you have to write at least 30, 40 songs. Because not every song is going to you know, be good. So you have to, the team has to write about 30, 40 songs. Out of that, maybe six to eight songs will be good that the congregate you know, that, that people can actually sing. Okay. Other songs will just fade away, fade away. So to get there, you have to plan, you have to train the team, encourage the team, and then there's a lot of work that goes into that, right? So this year, uh, the team. Uh, wrote, uh, I think, over 13 songs. Uh, and then out of that, they were able to select seven good songs. And the work is continuing. I mean, the, the team is continuing to work on new songs. But as of now, and they have recorded four songs so far. And they're planning to record two or three more, two more, I think, in November or something. So it's a motivation. You know, so that number is only a guideline. I'm not saying if you don't do it, you know, it's the end of the world or something. You know, just like, hey, try to release one new album every year with some new songs. Uh, but then the plan happens, you know, like the previous year, they plan, okay, next year we're going to release a new album. How do we encourage the worship team? How do we build them up? So every ministry area has a plan and is working towards it. So the, you, the worship pastor will be in charge of that. So then, in addition to this annual planning, what uh, is there are regular review meetings. Right? So that, like I said, for some areas, I'll be talking to the pastors every week. You know, that how is this going? How is that going? But definitely once a month. And uh, in some ministry areas, I, I would say, okay, you send a report once a month. And so, in for example, let's say life groups. So, in life groups, the life group report will say we have, we have so many life groups. All these life groups met every week. So many life groups met every week. So many life groups met at least once in the month. Um, so many new life groups have started, um, and. Uh, so many people are getting ready to start life. So those numbers, that report has these numbers for every month. So that's so that way, at least we have, we know that this is how our life groups are doing. And how many people are attending each life group. And we want to know what percentage of the church is actually participating in life groups. So these are numbers that are useful. And then we know how you know. Okay, we have to work on uh, building, uh, getting the others involved, building up more life groups, so on. Plus, we also look at okay, where are our life groups around the city? Which are the areas we need to start where we don't have life groups? So once a month, we'll sit and review this with the life group person who's, or the pastor who's in charge of life groups. And then, so I just had a meeting. Uh, Tuesday this week, so David Facebook. So we, we went over this. Okay, how are things going? And then 
give some ideas. Okay, these are things that can be done. These are things you need to focus on uh, to keep building the life force. So, like that uh, member care, how to, you know, caring for all our church members. Did everybody receive a phone call this last month? Did every household receive a phone call? You know, how many house visits did we make? Um, all you know, all these things. For these things, we put numbers you know, and the report. The person, pastor in charge, member care, will give the report. This is what happened. So then we actually know that this is what we are doing. You know, we are not simply saying, "Ah, huh, just call." You know, we don't know how many calls are made or how many people call, how many people are not called. Uh, we don't. So if you don't have numbers, but we have the numbers that you know, yeah, we covered everybody this month. Every household got a call and we and everything. Yeah, you know, on those kinds. Of things. So these regular review meetings are held once a month to just oversee the administrators and those pastors will then work with the their teams you know? so i just will meet with the pastors pastors work. any questions so far let me see online you all with me uh, everyone's with me any questions right so these review meetings are not to control the people like you know it's like oh uh, pastor is controlling me <laughs> he's telling me no 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 these review meetings are more to make sure that the work is being done you know and to actually assess what is being done and where can we make improvements or where are we falling short so if we don't have these review meetings every month and we just let people, okay, you just go to the ministry, then we are not sure. We don't know, right? Is the work being done? Is it not being done? Can we improve? Can we get better? Uh, you know, where are the gaps? We don't know that. So these review meetings are, are very important for us to make sure that, that each ministry is doing well. So let's go forward. All right. So what do you do when there are underperforming employees? So this is a different area now. Suppose you have put somebody in charge of a ministry. So okay, you take care of this. But the work is not getting done. What do we do? All right. So it is actually quite a problem because especially in a christian church ministry context because see in a in a corporate setting if somebody's not doing work say hey <laughs> fired yeah i mean you're not performing i will give you one chance with whatever and you have to leave um, or they can easily find somebody else to do the work but in a church in a christian ministry um, it's a little struggle because you want to show compassion. You want to be patient. You want to be kind. But at the same time, you know, work is not being done. <laughs> this person is, whatever the reason is, right? There could be many reasons. I'm not saying it's always the individual's fault. Whatever the reason is, the work is not getting done. Or it's not getting done at the level at which it should be getting done. Maybe, you know, you want the work. The work should be getting done a certain way. Maybe they are only doing 50%. They're doing something, but it's only 50% or 60%. It's not at the level that it should be done. Uh, this is a challenge. Right? So I can uh, I'll just share with you, you know, how what we how we handle it. I'm not saying this is the only way to do it, but so what I, I would normally do is, if somebody's not doing their work properly, or sometimes what happens is a, a, a ministry leader, a pastor, a ministry leader, he, has a, he or she has a team of people. And she, he or she will come to me and say, person A, so-and-so in their team is not performing. They've been given a certain role to do, but they're not doing it. So they'll come and tell them. Or sometimes it may be one of our own pastors or ministry leaders who are not doing what they're doing, up to the mark. How do we handle this? So first is we need to talk to them and see where is the problem. 
right? The problem could be maybe they don't have the required skills to do the job well. The problem may be sometimes they're going through some personal difficulties. Maybe they are going through some family problems, financial problems. So they're not able to concentrate on their work. That could be sometimes a reason why they're not able to perform. The problem could be maybe that uh, they, 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 have, they don't have the required support. Uh, they don't have the required resources to get the work done. And they have not come and told us, hey, I need three more computers to do it, or I need another one or two people to help me to do this. They haven't told us. So the work is not getting done. But that could be the problem. right? So before we pass on any judgment, the important thing is to have a conversation with the person. I said, hey, see, you know, um, in your ministry area, this is what the work should be done. And this, this is why. So this is where it's important to have the written guidelines, the rules, because they have read it. We have told them in writing, this is your role. This is the things you're supposed to be doing. And they can always reference it. We can always reference it. This is why that written role description is very important. So see, when you joined, when you started this, when you took this up, this is what we have said the role you should be fulfilling. But as we have observed the last so many months, only about 60% is getting done. What is the problem? So we need to find out what is the Why is it? Then, you know, if there is no proper answer, then it means maybe they are, don't have the skills. Or maybe they don't have the motivation. They're not enjoying that work. Maybe they want to be doing something else. So we have put them in the wrong place. Uh, you know, or maybe they're going through some personal problems. Or maybe they don't have the resource. So we need to understand. Them, okay? So let's say, okay, you know, let's say if it is, and so then we need to address the problem. So the next step is to address that specific problem. So if it is skill level or something, then I, you know, either we have to make a decision: can this person acquire those skills, or do we have to move them to another role? So, uh, if they can acquire the skills, then it's okay. Hey, in the next two months, please do these courses, please learn this skill, and try to be better. But if it's skills that they cannot acquire, maybe they don't have the capacity, maybe they don't have the interest to learn those skills, then we have to find some other role which is suited for them. Or if they're not they're not motivated to work in this area, then we have to move them. And we can have an honest conversation and see this work is very important. We can't keep you here. Uh, we will find somebody else for this role. And uh, we will find something else for you to do. Okay. And so we have to make that change. Now, sometimes we're able to make the change. We're able to give them some other role in the organization, in the ministry, that they can probably do well. Sometimes we're not able to do that. There is no other opening. There's no other opportunity in the ministry, in the organization, that, where they can fit. That's when we have to say, I'm very sorry. We will find somebody else for this role, but we don't have any other place for you. Uh, we have to give you 30 days notice. Uh, we request you to please find a job somewhere else. So that's a difficult part, but that has to be done because we have compassion. We have, you know, we are trying to help. But if it is a situation where you cannot help, then the final decision is a decision made in the best interest of the ministry. You know, the, the work that needs to be done, the people who need to be served, that's important. And we'll, you know, we give 30 days notice. That means for 30 days, they'll still get paid, but we encourage them to find something somewhere else. So everything is done in a very nice way, but we assess the matter. And depending on that, we can take the right action. So two important lessons here. Always do these kinds of things as far as possible in face-to-face -face meetings. 
I know I made mistakes in this area. I remember in the early days, we had one person working for us from home. Uh, I think she was, yeah, I think she, her role was a content writer or something. She was writing content. But she was working from home and she was in the she was in the far part of the city. She was somewhere in like Jainagar, JP Nagar side, you know, south of the city. Our office is here in the north of north side of the city. So I was, you know, we were, she was doing the work. Then after three months, I was, you know, I was, uh, in, these were early days. I mean, I made a lot of mistakes. Uh, I saw that she was not doing well, maybe one or two intra emails, interactions I had. And finally, I, I had to decide, like, okay, you are unnecessarily wasting time and money here. Let me let her go. The, my thought was, hey, she's living in the south side of the city. I don't want to tell her to come all the way from there to meet me in the office just for me to tell her that, hey, we are letting you go. I thought maybe I'll just send her an email. So I just, you know, politely <laughs> sent the email, hey, you know, sorry, yeah, the work is not up to the mark. And uh, therefore, you know, this is your last date. You know, the usual 30 days notice, and I gave, but she was very hurt by that. So it's very hurt. Why you have to do this by email? My thought was she's so far away. Why should I tell her to come to the office to tell her this news? I'll just communicate by email. That's when I learned that, hey, these difficult matters, it is better you sit in front of the person and talk. Don't do it by email. Yeah. Yet there is this convenience. Uh, it's very convenient. I can send one email. It's done. But it's a very difficult matter. You know, how will that other person receive it? Or if they have some questions or they want to discuss something, uh, they don't have the opportunity. Right? So that's when I, you know, that was one of my mistakes. And then I, I had to tell myself, okay, don't difficult matters always sit and after you talk, then you put it in an email. Okay, so the, I also say put everything in writing. That means after you finish discussion, put it down in an email. That is, okay, this is what we have discussed, or this is the decision we have made. So you need to put it in an email so that there is clarity and people don't forget what we have discussed. But difficult matters, sit down and talk. Have a face to face conversation as far as possible. Now, if they are living in another city or you know they're working remotely from somewhere else far away where they physically cannot come then yeah you have not no choice but to do a zoom call or something you know but as far as possible difficult matters sit and discuss it explain it listen to them they may have some reasons uh listen then put everything in writing and so this is what we have discussed Okay, so any sorry, any questions on this? All right, Rosalind, um, you uh, you had a question. Can you give an example for this? Um, sorry, what was the? Pastor, thing? you just shared an example. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. So, yeah. So you know. Uh, I made some mistakes, I had to learn through it. Collins, please go ahead, share what you have. Collins, you have something to share? Go ahead. Yeah, yes, Pastor. There is uh, what you've said that it is always good to have principles like mm -hmm. when you're going to take a, a decisive matter and you meet people face to face. But you see, human beings, I'm sorry to use this word, they can at times become human animals. What, <laughs> when you do A, they say you would have done B. Mm. So... I think, I think you answered it well that you must set guidelines that whenever maybe we are going to fire or shift somebody from here and here or whatever the case. We must 
must meet this person face to face. But you see, when, like you say, I evolved, and what I'm going to tell this person is not even adding, it's just my nursing. And uh, you were putting on sympathetic and empathetic shoes. But you see, if you had called them in the first place, <laughs> again, they would say, uh, if you had told them to come and meet you in the office, again, they would say, why wouldn't he email this to me? Imagine my <laughs> transport. Imagine the time I spent here I was going to get a negative. So it's always good to have a, a, a set procedure, but humans at times can become human animals. They will always hope, opt for the what you didn't do to have been the best solution. Thank you, Pastor. <laughs> yeah. Two comments. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes we, we can't predict how people will react. Uh, it is true. Um, but yeah, we try to do the best. We try to do the best. And I think most important is uh, as long as our conscience is clear, you know, that uh, the decision I'm making is for the good of the church. It is for the good of the people we are serving. Therefore, I have to make this decision. It may be very tough. This, this is, you know, especially when you're changing people, roles, or have to letting people go. It is you're doing your conscience is clear. You're not doing it out of wrong intention. You know, then you know I think that that would be a guideline for us uh, to maintain. Right? So. Uh, in ministry, uh, having a good review process is important because it gives you the basis then for making decisions. Right? Without the review process, I cannot tell you know somebody is doing their work or not doing their work. Uh, so it's also unfair. Suddenly I can't say you're not doing your work, but if, if if you know you find that over three four months they're not doing their work, then yeah, it's like three four months we have discussed. You know, doing the work, so now I have to find out another person and make the change. So these are difficult things, difficult things in the ministry, but we should try to do it as kindly as we can, the best we can. Uh, and as Colin Collins pointed out, you can't predict the reaction. Some people may take it well, some people may not take it well. Uh, and but you know, our, we have to keep our conscience clear that we have done the right thing. Uh, in the right, best way we know how to do. Okay. So, um, the uh, next part that I just want to um, talk about a little bit is uh, developing our people. That means employee development, page 26. That means, you know, uh, we want to make sure that our people, the, the staff, the church staff especially, they themselves are growing. If they keep growing, then their work will also keep improving. Okay? If they don't keep upskilling themselves, learning new things, learning how to, especially now in, in a city, in a city, working in a city means you have to keep learning new technology, keep learning new things. If they don't keep learning new things and uh, being exposed to new ideas, then what they are doing in the ministry may not keep growing. So we have to think about how do we keep our people learning, developing themselves. So uh, that is something we think about. And of course, depending on their role, depending on what they're doing, we can encourage them. Uh, one is they, they will, of course, get on the job training. Uh, and uh, we also, every month, we do a staff meeting. So the staff meeting happens on the last Thursday of every month. Uh, of course, uh, part of the staff meeting is yeah, we spend time in prayer and worship, all of that. There's a devotional part to it. Then there is a practical part. The practical part is that we have one hour learning a presentation or something new, something you know, what we want everybody to learn, that everybody can use or understand in their area of ministry. 
So things like how do you do project management? How do you do people management? How do you build your team? How do you anything that that helps them in their work? And this, this so, so every month there is staff meeting. On the last Thursday of the month, the afternoon, we do that. Uh, spiritual and practical. Then on the job, of course, we encourage people to mentor others. You know, so uh, if there's a senior person, we'll tell the, encourage that person to develop the junior person. Hey, here's a new person, you know, train him, help him to grow, learn, etc. So there's on the job nurturing training that we encourage people to do uh, we also like i mentioned earlier we provide ten thousand rupees every year for people to do courses so they can use it however they want every individual you can do online course you can go to a con you know go to a in-person course whatever you spend that money for your own development right? it's up there it's there but if you're doing a course you have to finish the course you have to pass the course Show us that you've completed the search. Other people will simply join and you know they'll waste the money. So the condition is you go and complete the course, we'll reimburse you up to 10,000 rupees each person. So that option is there. Or of course, uh, we they can do free courses online, all of that. Then we tell them for our staff, all our training is free. That means every staff can attend at least. I think it's uh, two courses, Bible college courses for free every semester, if they want to. That means four hours a week they can use for their learning, attending a course, and uh, as part of their work. Right? Spiritual, that is spiritual development. And also our weekend school. So every month we have one weekend school on a Saturday. We say you can attend the weekend school for free. And it will be considered as part of your work work time. So these are just opportunities we're giving to our staff, saying you can take advantage of these things. They are happening all the time. Anytime you want, you can attend, but it's for your development, spiritual or practical development. Okay. Right. And uh, yeah, let, let's pause here. I'll come back and I'll take this forward. Okay. Finish this up. Yeah. Okay. Let's go for a quick break and we'll come back in 10 minutes and we will continue this yeah so the weekend school uh, so the weekend school usually happens every second saturday and we have different topics uh, that we cover you know like healing and deliverance gifts of the spirit uh, um, inner wholeness God at, God at work. Uh, so different topics throughout the year. And they'll keep repeating every year. Same things, uh, same topics are covered. Of course, the content will be a little bit more enhanced every year. But it happens second Saturday every month, full full day, morning 9.30 to 5.30. So people come to the church office and that we conduct it. It's more like a seminar kind of thing, but very informal. People ask a lot of questions, we pray, we minister. Okay, let's pause. We'll be we'll come back in ten minutes. Thank you.